always, we want to give a big shout out to our sponsors at Helix Sleep. You can take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life. Find your perfect mattress at helixsleep.com slash punches. for watching the podcast listening to the podcast and for sticking with me as we go through these changes been having a little bit of complications on my surgery that made me not uh feel up to doing some stuff and moving's been slow and then the baby showed up so we just been busy there are boxes everywhere uh we're gonna get back into doing some regular guests for you real soon i promise or i'll just quit who knows with me <laughs> Uh, but as long as you're getting some of it out of it, I would continue to try to do this podcast for sure. So I hope you're into it. Um, this week is the Netflix is a joke festival. So if you are in the Los Angeles area, you can see me. Uh, well, Monday, which is today, you're probably too late to see this, but I'm doing the table read of Friday with Seth Rogen and some friends. Um, I have my show on Cinco de Mayo at the Troubadour. Uh, so please come down there. It's me, Brian Posehn, Jackie Cation, and Blair Saki. Uh, tickets are still available. Go to rompunches.com. Please go grab those. And then I'll be doing uh, the Amy Schumer and Friends and the Drew Lynch and Friends. Uh, the Amy Schumer and Friends is a taping that they're doing down at the Palladium, I believe leave so you can get tickets for that as well um other than that we got loot coming june 24th we got the tour the back at it tour that starts at that same month as well so if you are in boston if you are in dc if you are in seattle if you are pretty much kansas city san diego everywhere if i'm in the, please just check it out ronfuches.com go get some tickets right now to go see me on tour this summer other than that let's get to the podcast I hope you're feeling strong. I hope you're feeling brave. I hope you're feeling loved and grateful for that love. There's abundance of love surrounding me as my new son has been born and brought into this world. Little Teddy is here and we are so happy and so sleepy and sometimes cranky and still getting into arguments, but (laughs) <laughs> what do you expect with a severe lack of sleep that's gonna happen but overall just loving my family loving my son he had great timing he was born on april 21st um the day before was of course 420 one of my sacred holidays one of my favorite of all the holidays and i had been expecting to take it off and not go and enjoy anything and be prepared in case my son was coming. But my wife was like, nothing seems like it's happening. I'm sitting high and tight. I got uh, going to get induced in a week. So you can, why don't you go out, have yourself one little fun little night. I got invited by the Chop 420 chefs to a fun dinner. And when they invite you to a dinner, you know it is going to be delicious and get you fucked up. And so... She said, go to the, your dinner. I'll be fine. The baby's going to stay here. I'm just going to be in the backyard flipping tires with all this new energy that she suddenly had. She was just back there doing shuttle runs. Uh, <laughs> just lifting doing squats just doing deadlifts um so so that should have told me something was up (laughs) the fact that i came home and she had emptied out every single of our moving boxes in the closet should have let me know she was in some high key nesting but i wanted to go to the party and she let me go and i went to that party and i had a great time so chef uh if you're familiar with chop 420 you know some of my favorite chefs and they were there chef victor was there chef chris minota was there chef wendy was there it was a blast i I smoked a couple blunts i took a little dab which i had not done in so long i ate so many edible deliciousness of meats and crab and 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 it just infused smoke and bubbles it was a beautiful time and i came back home and i was floating on a cloud i was was like i'm gonna lay down and just float away and think about my new son that's coming any day now and i closed my eyes for about 20 minutes and i hear my wife going oh i feel a little uncomfortable and she stands up gets out of bed and just 
releases what could only be described as clear gelatin onto the floor as if she had dropped a tray of uh, a hospital meal that she <laughs> And I was like, "Uh oh, <laughs> I have taken two blunts to my face by myself, two dabs at least, ten to fifteen milligrams of edibles uh, in my food, countless bowls I had smoked, and now it looks like this boy is on the way." And so my wife was like, "Are you okay to drive me to the hospital?" And I did the right thing. I did the thing that you're supposed to do as a man, as a father, as a husband. I lied to my wife and I told her I'm just fine and I couldn't do it. <laughs> I wasn't fine at all. <laughs> I was quite fucked up. But guess what happens when a baby's coming? You sober up real quick. And so I did. We went down to the hospital late at night. About got there at two in the morning. Uh, just got her admitted to the hospital. We waited until the afternoon. And uh, by three o'clock in the afternoon, she was ready to push. She pushed for like 35 minutes. And, the, and Teddy was here. Just a sweet little boy yelling a little bit but mostly just being himself polite and sweet and quiet and nice. And um, I don't know if you've ever, this is my second birth of a child. If you've ever been through one, you know what I'm talking about. You know the feeling. You know that feeling when you're like, I am both obsolete and also very important because I need to take care of this next generation. Uh, and you really get to see what's truly important to you and what simple things make you happy and make you feel good and, and ever since he's been born, you know, I've been back to work, unfortunately, doing some voiceovers, doing some acting. And, but every time I'm just happy to come home and see his face and see, see him grab my finger with his whole hand. And that's just something beautiful about that. And I'm not sure. I'm sure parenting is not for everyone, uh, but I think it is for me. I love being a dad. I love um having somebody to care for. I even love somebody, you know, getting on my case, which has been, uh, she going to listen to this either way. <laughs> but trying for me to step up, do a little bit more. And I'm trying, I'm doing it. I wish I get a little bit more credit for the shit I am doing, but either way. Uh, <laughs> I will understand that it is, I mean, man, I being a mom is difficult. Being a dad, you know, I got to change a diaper. I got to hold him every now and then. But then, you know, he he, he can't, I, I ain't got no milk for him. So he 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 moves on from me eventually. But um, it's those moms. We got Mother's Day coming up soon. And it's just, man, you got to, it's hard being a mom. It's hard being a good mom. Being a mom that wants to be a mom and wants to take care of their kid and always got to be worried about their kid. Uh, but at the same time, trying not to be overly consumed to where that's the entire part of your life and your entire identity, right? Like, you want to still be a full-functioning human being that is, a, a you know, a woman, a, a, maybe an aunt, a sister, who knows, a lover, a friend, a freak in the sheets. <laughs> I'm just hoping, um, <laughs> but I just, you know, want to salute the moms out there. Salute to my wife who was, um, I always knew she'd be a great mom cause she was a great step mom, but just within the first week seeing how much she just truly cares about Teddy and how much she, uh, puts sacrifices for him. And it's just a beautiful thing to watch. Being a mom is a beautiful, uh, I would say uh, that we don't really celebrate it, but we celebrate it a lot. <laughs> I think we do celebrate it. A <laughs> but not enough, but still not enough. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of moms, um, we had, on the other side of the clone, we had a birth, we had a death. My grandmother passed away this uh, about a week and a half ago. And, I went to the funeral this last week, which was a unique experience for me because I don't really see my dad's side of the family that much. My dad and I have, what uh, if you were going to check it on Facebook, it would say it's complicated uh, for sure. 
Uh, so my dad and I don't often see each other and don't, um, but, but my grandmother who lived in Carson, California, and I would see her every summer when we would visit from Chicago to come visit my dad. And she'd always, you know, classic grandma, just keeping you in church, keeping you in church Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, uh, too many days to me. But, um, I guess also when you live in an area where there's a lot of streets issues gang issues the best thing you can do is try to keep your family in the church and that's what she did generations she could kept her kids her grandkids everyone around her in the church gave them some type of uh spirituality base and they can take it from there for me i'm a little bit less uh organized about it i'm not a big fan of going to church or anything like that but i do consider myself very spiritual and very much uh spiritual not religious is what i consider myself um but a lot of the way i like to treat people and be treated and respect and the yes ma'am no ma'am um yes sir thank yous all those things that people see in me that uh, a lot of people think sets me apart which because i still do that if you catch me on a set working with people i'm still yes sir no sir yes ma'am no ma'am because that's just how I was raised. And it's quicker to me. It's more efficient. Um, but and it's simple. But manners like that, being a good person, um, especially in a world where where things are so negative sometimes and there's so many the reasons why you you feel like it's okay to be short with people or to step on people or to uh, basically say, fuck other people, get mine. Um, my grandmother always taught me to have manners, to be uh civilized to be a good person and i really appreciate her and appreciate the lessons that she taught me and appreciate the protection that she gave to me and to a lot of the family members and a lot of uh of the grandchildren when sometimes um you know again my relationship with my dad's not the best he i don't feel like he was always the best protector and my grandmother was there to protect me in in those cases and i will always appreciate her for that and that's what i told her at the funeral um to her casket and also it's just fun go to a black funeral if you've never been to one they're fun people think it's all people falling out and crying all over the place and it's a little bit of that but it's also just like a really fun party and fun outfits and super churchy and people will say things like let's let's go back to the old testament and i think that's fun when they say that <laughs> It's like, oh, my grandma, well, when are we going to get to my grandma? <laughs> if we got to start at the old, if we got to start with Job. <laughs> when are we going to get to my grandma? Uh, <laughs> but uh, most of all, I'm thankful that it forced me to get back in touch with some of my family members and to, I think sometimes we, 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 we regress ourselves and we trap ourselves to how we felt when we were kids or teens or feeling that we can't we weren't protected or we weren't taken care of um and at some point you gotta realize especially if you are my age where you're almost 40 that uh you 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 protect yourself now you are in charge of yourself and you don't have to worry about some parent or some bubble you know some person who's supposed to take care of you falling down on the job because you protect yourself so i can explore a relationship more with some of my family members with my dad with my cousins um and see where that goes who knows i really appreciate it how many of them seem to be following my career and uh, are proud of me and uh you know family is important nothing like family family is also what you make it so i never get trapped up in that like you gotta be there for your family like sometimes family be trying to fuck your shit up so you got <laughs> You can't have them put your hands on your life like a remote control. That's have you traveling down that same bumpy tore up road. Uh, that's from Devin the Dude. He told it's called uh, Do What You Want to Do, something like that. I don't remember the name of the song, but it always stuck in my head is that you can't let just because people are 
older than you, seniority than you, are in the family with you, you can't let them control your life, control what you feel is best for you. You got to hope that you do what's best for you and they'll be there to support you because that's what family is and that's what family is supposed to be. And I have that around me, whether they are my blood family or my artistic family or my wife, the people who support me and want the best out of me and want me to, to, to be my best self. And I'm appreciative of that. And if you don't have that around you, you got to start thinking about what you're doing. What, what, why are you attracting these people into your life that are always so negative and so shitty towards you? Because it's usually the law of attraction. You're doing something to bring these people into your life. Lord knows I was when I was in, when I had bad friends and I had bad people around me. It's also because I was being that way. I was trying to get over on people. I was trying to fucking skip steps. But once I got rid of that type of vice, once I wanted to just go to open mics and do art and shit, it's weird how many people disappear from your life when you when you actually starting to put in that work and they don't want to be around that work because they just want to hang out and play all day. It's, it's, ugh, I mean, <laughs> I just have a guttural reality. Nothing worse than me than grown adults that want to hang out. Go get a fucking job, bitch. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you ain't got no family. You ain't got no fucking family. You ain't got no fucking kid to raise. You ain't got shit to do. You ain't got no hobbies, no crafts. You want to hang out with me? Ugh, it better be an event. We making money or we going to an event? If it's not either one of those, I don't want to hang out with you. I'm just not a hangout type of guy. I'm not nothing against people who love a good hang, people who love to socialize. If that's you, that's fine. I'm sure there's a lot of, of positivity that comes out of that. But for me, it just made me feel like I'm wasting my goddamn time. So <laughs> I'd rather either be resting or working. That's my mode. I like to rest and I like to work. I like to be with my family and I'll be with my friends, including this next gentleman who's like a family member to me because of all the support he gave me from way before I even knew who he was or he knew who I was. I knew who he was for sure, but he didn't know who I was. He was just a weird, uh, smart, kind comedian who was doing the type of things that I enjoyed and I wasn't seeing in this world. And it inspired me to get into comedy, inspired me to write, inspired me to do stand up. And then years later, I'm working with him, going on tours with him, uh, just and oh, and when my son was born, I was wearing a T-shirt and a sweater with his name on it because that's how important he is to my family. Also, it was just a coincidence, but it makes a good podcast intro, huh? Today's best of getting better is one of my favorite episodes of all time. One of our few away game episodes. I think the only one because the only two we got two away game. Oh. Oh yeah, ooh yeah. You gotta be. I gotta really care about you to actually leave my area to go to your area to do a podcast. And this person that definitely counts, mentor, friend, legend, uh, kind person, and hilarious, intelligent man, Conan O'Brien. Enjoy it. This is nice. This is like a. This is an oasis of calm. Mm. This is good. Yeah. Nice. Hey, Will, you ready? Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Will. Halston's here, too. Hey, Halston. I met Halston. Nice. Thank you for being here, Colin. I love spending time with you. I appreciate You're that. You're a very uh, pleasant person to spend time with. Thank you. You know Why? Uh, because you are very comfortable with yourself. And you know what you like and you know what you don't like. Uh, and I don't mean that in like a narcissistic way. You're just very aware of this is what I want to be doing. This is what I enjoy. You're polite to people, but you're not trying. I don't get, I don't get like a anxious energy off of you ever. Mm, a desperation. You know? There's no desperation. I think I supply that for... <laughs> <laughs> For all of us. I have enough for all of us. If you want to borrow any desperation, <laughs> any need to please, I got. You I got see, a lot of it. Yeah, I, I know that. <laughs> I 
I know yeah. that about you. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> it's one of the things that I like about you, though. It's, oh, really? It is. Um, I do have questions about it, but yeah. we'll get into it because uh, that is usually how I start. So I appreciate you saying that about me. And I'll tell you what I like about you. Um, obviously, I love your comedy. I love oh. your comedic mind. Thank I you. feel like I am. Um, You've shaped so many people and helped other people, and me included. So I appreciate that. But as a person, um, what I really like about you, um, what I learned from going on tour with you, is how genuine and how giving you are with people with your time. And, I mean, including being here today when you have plenty of things to do. But I noticed on tour, whether it was like um, a comic that wanted to talk with you, or a driver that wanted to talk to you, or just someone at a restaurant who's taking pictures behind your head mm-hmm. in a way that um, I don't know how I would deal with. I would be annoyed, and you seem to have this ability um, to give people time and to make them feel special. And um, that's oh, one of the things I I'm really I'm glad like. that came across. I do, uh, I don't know, it might be my philosophy of, um, uh, I think for whatever reason I sense when other people may be uncomfortable or want something. And a lot of times I can give it to them and it doesn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. It takes a second to be nice to somebody. And then there are times where that same instinct gets me in trouble because I'll try to, um, I'll notice that oh, wait, this is going too far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm too worried about how this person thinks of me. And I'm uh, too involved and invested now. And so that can cause trouble too. Like there's sometimes not to, well, the, yes, I'm gonna name drop, but the last time I talked to Tom Hanks, I think it was on my show, uh, you know, he's well known for just being such a nice person. And he really is a genuinely nice person. But he said the only time that he doesn't gets uh, starts to get in a snit is when he feels like people are taking advantage of that, mm-hmm. and uh, so that can happen sometimes. And I think I've gotten better as I get older. As I get older, I mean, you know, we're so obsessed with youth, mm-hmm. and I like getting older. I actually think my life is more enjoyable the older I get because I'm just better. It's like I figured out the warranty that comes with being a Conan. You know, like you come out of the box and you spend a bunch of years and you don't even have any idea why you're doing the things you're doing. And then over time, if you do some self-examination and work on yourself, it's like someone showed you, you get a look at, oh, this is, these are the strengths of the Conan, you know, mm-hmm. 2.7. Uh, oh, and here are the things you gotta watch out for. It will do this too much. It will do that too much. Sometimes it it airs too much this way, and you can rein it in. So I don't know. I think I'm 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 a work in progress, but uh, I do not. I'm very aware now. For the most part, I like giving people. It takes a second and makes them happy, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I want them to. I know what it felt like for me when I was younger and I met some of my idols and when they were nice and they were the person that I thought they might be, Mm -hmm. it felt like a religious experience. It felt like, oh my God, the world does make sense. John Candy is a really nice, funny guy. He's the guy I wanted him to be. And then every now and then you meet someone and of course they're not the person that you wanted them to be and that's upsetting. So I always try to be the first person. Yeah, I think it's important, it's also, I, I like to do the same thing. I have to, um, my fiance, who you know, and told mm-hmm. me to tell you hello. Uh, she's been more helpful as far as like, hey, you sometimes you you do you give too much of yourself, or you mm-hmm. you don't know. Because often, as she says, she's like, she'll meet someone at a show with me, and then she's like, who's who's that friend of yours? How long have you known them? I go, oh, I I just met them tonight, and she's like, oh, I talk to them like you've known them for years. Yeah, she's like, you got to let me know who is. Who- you need a signal. You yeah. need a signal <laughs> where you say like, yeah, I I just met this person. And I don't really give a shit, <laughs> but I'm going to be nice to them. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I, I've i been married a long time. I got married, uh, and I recommend it. If you find the right person and you have found the right person, 
it's it's great because you get you get this partner who is who knows you really well and my wife sometimes when my wheels start to spin she'll be like you know you're just doing that thing you do mm -hmm. and i'll go oh right I think I'll have a banana split, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, 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 she can just take the needle out of the groove because mm -hmm. I get, you can get stuck in being you. And then you have this person who's not, who knows you and can say, yeah, you, you got to watch that. Yeah, they can see your patterns better than you can. And in some ways, that's what's scary about letting someone in that much and living with someone is then you're like, oh, you're going to see all aspects of me. Um, and that's why I, I just went to a parent-teacher conference with, with um, she doesn't like that when we say her name. <laughs> with, she doesn't? Why? Not on this podcast. She's a very shy person. Let's change your name. Okay. April O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love, love April O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> She's the best. But it is a thing that I've been, because there's always kind of these two rows of thought when it comes to entertainment and comedy. And I think it's one of the things you told me that really... Um, you made my day that day. It was um, one day I came on the show, I think it might have been the second or third time, and you you leaned over to me after the segment and you go, I, what I like about you is that it seems like you like comedy for comedy. You're yeah. not here for girls or money or things right. like that. Right. And that just seems like the two roads that you can travel. It just also seems so difficult because so many ladies like you and mm -hmm. always talking about you, my fiance included. Mm -hmm. And so... Well, you know, it's funny because initially I don't know anybody who's in comedy who didn't want to attract, you know, whatever their preference is, same mm -hmm. sex, uh, you know, opposite sex, or didn't want to be noticed to even on a, on a broader sense. Like I, I really honed my skills because I wanted to, uh, I wanted girls to notice me and I was not an athlete and, uh, you know, took me a long time um, to become average looking. <laughs> and so I fought to become average looking. And, but it, but it was, that was my, my go-to was I could make women laugh. I could make first girls laugh and then women laugh. And that was sort of my, okay, I got that. Mm -hmm. I got that. Um, and what happens is you do go through this like, um, moment of, well, wait a minute, once you get married, you know, uh, and you realize, oh, it's still, I can still make people laugh and I still enjoy making people laugh. It's not going to end up in anything, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, but I realized how much making people laugh and being silly is just part of my DNA. I do it just because I've got to do it and it's what I like to do. It's who I am. And I think that's the same way you are. You realize that, oh yeah, you'd be thinking of funny things. You know, it used to be, now if you want to be in comedy, you can figure out a way to be in comedy somehow. But it used to be hardly anybody got to be in comedy. If you won't go back to like the 1930s, there's like 1% 1 of 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 the country gets to be in, in comedy or less. And then every, everywhere else you go, there's like, he's a funny plumber. Mm -hmm. He's a really funny doctor. Mm -hmm. That guy's a really funny carpenter. People, you know, today, if you're funny at all, I get the feeling sometimes people think, hey, wait a minute, you should have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's the way it was for a long time. And I might've come along. I have tons of really funny people in my family. And I think for the longest time, and I, I'm sure I have for generations and for the longest time, People were like, You're, that guy's really funny. Now get out there and plow that field. <laughs> you stupid Irish hick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get out there and build that wall with your hands. <laughs> you dumb Irish fuck. But by the way, you're really funny. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a, a prof it is better to do it professionally, but there's just a big power. I, um, I don't know how it was for you, but I'm gonna speak um, for me. It was that I had this power where I could see if like, my mom was stressed out because she's a single mom mm -hmm. or, or, you know, my sister's stressed out because my dad's not around or whatever. I had the power to put people at ease, to make yes. people forget. Um, the time, the earliest moment of me realizing that comedy was a power and something that I could use was 
my mom sending me to my room and me knowing that she was coming up to spank me and then talking to my sister about how bad it was going to be and still making fun of her. And my mom was listening in the other room and she just started laughing to the point that she forgot what she came up to do. That's great. And I was like, oh, oh, this is, this is amazing. Well, that's the thing is, uh, <clears throat> you know, you spend the first part of your life, and I completely relate to that, using comedy to get out of a jam. And I never, when I was a kid, I never thought this was a profession. I didn't think, I didn't know anybody in show business. It wasn't, you know, sometimes you meet people that grew up around Los Angeles and their parents were in the business and their parents worked on TV shows or their parents were comedians. And so that just feels like more of a natural step. To me, when I was a kid, getting paid to do comedy, I never thought about it, but if someone had suggested it, I think going to Mars would have sounded <laughs> as likely, mm -hmm. you know? Like this is not gonna happen. I don't see any way to make that happen. I'm growing up in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's the 19, early 1970s, and no, there's not, not, that's not gonna happen. And so it was, uh, you know, the reasons that I was being funny was to make my brothers laugh and make my parents laugh. And yeah, ease tension. Mm -hmm. Like it's a great way. It's a, it's a very great natural superpower to just be able to go into a tense situation and say something and people relax. And then people uh, value you because you put people at ease and you know what to say in a tense situation. And so uh, that's where it all begins. It really begins there. It begins with you just trying to, you know, getting your mom to laugh and not getting spanked or me talking my way out of a beating somehow uh, at school or whatever, um, and or just making my brothers laugh or being, being the new kid in a new school, in a big school when I went to fourth grade and really being miserable and then having people say, hey, that guy's kind of funny and realizing, okay, this is what I got. Mm. I got to hone this. I got to keep working on this because this is going to, I am not going to get, uh, you know, I'm not going to the NFL. That's <laughs> not going <laughs> to, they're not looking for anybody like me. So this is my way to, to get along. And then what happens later on is you realize, oh, there's actually some jobs mm. where they're looking for people like this. Could I be one of those people? And it took me so long to get my confidence. It just took forever. And still, if I'm asked to do something, hey, can you go and do this event? Can you go to this? They want you to go to this event and they want you to be funny. I think, oh my God, I, I gotta be funny. What if I'm not funny? And I go through the whole thing again. Now, people that don't know me would say, oh, but you've been in this business for 30 some odd years and you're a known name. So it'd be the easiest thing in the world for you to go up there and do it. No, it's not. You gotta like think about it. You gotta, you gotta yeah. figure it out and go through some of the pain again. I think that's when people, cause the weirdest question I think people give standups usually is like, oh, do you still get nervous? Do you still, do you still get worried? And it's just like, of course I don't get the same level of nervousness where I'm gonna vomit like when I was a year in. But I, when you care, when you wanna do well, I think there's always this like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know how it'll go this time. Well, see, that's the thing. This is why uh, I always envy musicians because I've been in situations like at a benefit where I have to go up there and be funny. And then I'll look over and Sting or Bruce Springsteen or whoever the musician is at the event, he's gonna go up there and he's gonna do three songs that people love to hear and he knows how to play them. And if and he's played them a million times and he's gonna get up there and go, Roxanne, <laughs> you don't have to put on the red light. And people are gonna go, oh my God. And if forgot for if he misses a note, no one's gonna notice. Afterwards, people are just gonna be like, man, Sting was great. But comedians get judged every time it's a new, it's a fresh sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And that's how it feels. Like they're not. And uh, there, it's the one, you know, when you do a lot of these events, or if you do a gig, you know that a lot of comedy, the success is, wait a minute, what's the crowd like? Mm -hmm. What's the venue like? 
if it's really big in the audience and it's really wide, there's certain theaters that are really wide and big. There's certain theaters where people can go get alcohol throughout the show. Mm -hmm. There are certain gigs where it's a fundraiser and it's really rich people and they're eating and they're not paying attention. There's other gigs where there's a lot of celebrities in the audience. And so they care more about themselves and they're, they're not really, you know, and people in the room are all looking over at the big celebrities. So every gig is different. It's like saying to a, you know, golfers, a golfer can have an amazing, professional golfer can win, you know, the masters. And then the next week have a terrible round of golf where if you were seeing them for the first time, you'd say, I don't know, that guy sucks. <laughs> he's, he's terrible. That's how much it changes for comics. It's always a new situation. And I always think for musicians, it's a little less, it's a little more forgiving. That's how it always seems to me. Like, man, if I had a, a guitar and I knew, and I had 10 hit songs, I might do that rather than, <laughs> rather than go out there. Well, like, you have the guitar. Yeah, yeah, I have the guitar. I just don't have the hit songs uh, or <laughs> any of the abilities that need to you know go along with it. But I would, um, I mean, I get nervous if I go to an event, like a, if I go to just an event that's not televised, if I go to a, a party and someone's got engaged, someone got engaged and they say, might be nice if you got up and said a few words. Mm -hmm. I get in my head and go, oh. And there might be 50 people in the room and it doesn't matter, but it matters. Yeah. Because the feeling of, uh, the feeling of attempting comedy <laughs> and it doesn't go well is, the, is so horrible. That feeling is so bad. I always have a sense memory of, that's all, that's always, that could always be seconds away. So someone says, hey, could you, you know, it'd be nice if you got up and just said a couple of words. People are getting up and giving some quick speeches. Connor, why don't you just, and you're like literally drinking wine out of a paper cup. <laughs> and suddenly anyone else in the room thinks, well, Conan's not nervous. Of course I am. Cause I need it. I want it to go well. I want it to be good. I want it to be right. And if it's not good, I'd go home. And I get in my head about it. And I'm like, you know what? That, that wasn't great. I should have given that more thought. Uh, and then I remember it later. And then I get up in the night to pee and I'll be like peeing and go like, ah. Uh, I, and I'm one of those people that says out loud, I go, fuck. Mm -hmm. And Liza will wake up and go like, what happened? And I'll be like, oh no, I was just remembering a wedding toast that I didn't have a good ender for <laughs> six years ago. <laughs> It's, that's true. I'm not even kidding. That is absolutely true. I love it. I love that you care that much. That's, and it's good that that hasn't gone away. You like sleeping? You like laying in bed, having a bad picnic with your significant other, eating sandwiches and things that are probably going to leave too many crumbs in your bed? Of course you do. You listen to this podcast. If you're like me, you know that you spend the majority of your life in your bed and so you might as well get the best quality mattress you can and i know what you're saying hey ron don't i have to go to some expensive store don't i have to spend all day at some mattress store talking to a mattress salesman who's going to try to upsell me and make me get an undercoating on my mattress <laughs> No, not anymore. Thanks to Helix Sleep. Take the Helix quiz from the comfort of your own home and you get matched up with a mattress that will fit you, fit the way you sleep, your size, and if you sleep hot or cold. Uh, for me, I like a little bit of a softer mattress, but that is still a little bit firm. Also, I like it to be colder because I'm a hot boy. And plus, I needed that plus size mattress. And Helix Sleep, I filled out their quiz and they matched me with a mattress that was perfect for me. Shipped directly to my house. Popped open like a giant state puff marshmallow. Helix is awesome, but you're going to have to take my word for it. You can see the fact they were voted the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wire magazine 
Just go to helixsleep.com slash funches, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and you'll get matched to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. You want to be custom fitted, whether it's suited, booted, or sleeping. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll come and pick it up. If you don't love it, just make sure you flip the sides that got the stain on it. You know what I'm talking about. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. They assume you got somebody else that's gonna get up in there helixsleep.com slash funches go to helixsleep.com slash funches for up to two hundred dollars off all mattresses and two free pillows one thing you mentioned earlier about the, your enjoyment of getting older and that's something i i agree with just mostly because i i never fell for that like oh be fun and have all this great time in your 20s. I was like, I'm just trying to survive. Yeah. I'm just trying to get through this because I knew from being a fan of comedy and uh, all the people who I enjoyed, it was like, oh, it seemed like everybody's starving in their 20s. And then if, if I just make it through, get to my 30s, something will happen. And, and luckily it has. And I just, um, but what I want to talk about with you is just how dramatically different a position you've been in from constantly like fighting to keep your show going mm-hmm. and, and kind of being th- like this rebel of late night comedy um to now you're you're the elder statesman of late night comedy yeah. um and so i just kind of want to see what do you see your role as now because i think part of that was like your tour and taking all these people where you're introducing these new comics out and i was like that's i've never seen anyone else do that in late night well uh, you know i uh it is weird because it flips overnight. So you spend years being, I spent years feeling like the new guy who had to prove himself. And that just felt like years and literally years and years and years of I got to prove myself, I got to prove myself. And then finally one night they're like, you're the old man. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait a minute, yesterday I was still, I went from being a punk who needed to prove himself to, that's how it felt to me Mm -hmm. overnight. But so it is drastically different. Um, That's one of the other things I like about getting older is when I drive around, you know, I got my start, a lot of people don't know this, but I got my start out in Los Angeles and working on these different shows out in Los Angeles when I was 22 and driving around in a really crappy car and living in a $380 a month apartment and what I remember is just the desperation of, am I gonna make it? Am I gonna make it? Am I gonna make it? Um, and that was with me all the time. And so when I drive, like last night, I met some friends in Hollywood, sort of near the like the La Brea Tar Pits for a bite to eat. And that's where I used to live. And even driving around there, I'm like, oh man, that guy, I have, I have affection for that guy. Mm. But I was this 22 year old, super skinny guy, didn't know how to dress, had a crappy car, didn't know how to ask someone out. Um, and so worried. And now it's all these years later, but I still drive around those neighborhoods and I get a pang of that old feeling of like, man, I remember when I lived on Cochrane, mm-hmm. which is this street and I lived in this really funky apartment and, I furnished it by getting furniture. People in LA just put their furniture out on the street. And so I walked around and picked up furniture and that's how I furnished my apartment. And then was shocked if, if a woman ever came over that she, <laughs> that she, she just, it looked like a, a segment from Hoarders, you know, it just was this crappy. Uh, and I was like, wait, they don't, they don't love this place. Um, but what I, you have all those years of that and then suddenly now, at my age now, which is 56, I'm like, huh, yeah, it, there's no longer, I suddenly became, you know, the old professor that's at the college. So what do you do now? Mm-hmm. And I get a visceral uh, like excitement being around funny people. And I really like being around young funny people and it sounds, it's almost like a vampire kind of thing, but like I get energy from young funny people and I feel like they, I'm very kid-like in a lot of ways. Uh, So I still enjoy 
being around the great, obviously the great comedians and the great people that are much older than me or my age, but um, I, I get excited about being around young, funny people who have th these ways of thinking that like spark my brain. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. And I always think it'd be really nice if whatever ends up happening with me and my career, whenever it, you know, it peters out, I like the idea of, I've got all these friends that are now hitting their prime and they owe me. <laughs> <laughs> It's really, that's the gamble. <laughs> Smart, yeah. yeah. See, and then Ron's like, oh my God, Ron just blew up. And it's, you know, and I'm like, hey, Ron. <laughs> so maybe a cameo in your next, <laughs> in your next film? I'm like, uh, I don't see how you fit into this story. <laughs> you want to play my son? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they put you in that Death Stranding game. It, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I can get urinated on. <laughs> People love urinating on you. If you don't know the reference, I, I did a travel show in Tokyo and I got put into this really cool game, Death Stranding, and then, <laughs> which was fun. And I guess people love finding my character. You got to mm -hmm. find me. And then uh, I think they like urinating on my, where I live. Yeah. They like urinating right in front of your place. Yeah. 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 Which I consider to be a high compliment. <laughs> And your laughter means, yes, it is. Yeah, compliment. sure. I mean, in P in most games, teabagging, all high compliments. Everybody loves them. Yeah. Um, so in relation to you talking about getting older in comedy and in the young comics that you do enjoy, and I, I feel, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I'm still mid-30s, but when I see a comic that's like, like Taylor Tomlinson or someone even younger than that, when I just go, oh, wow. And not, not only that, it makes me go like, Oh, quit trying to chase that. Like, there was this time period where I was like, oh, I'm not the, like, young comic who knows all the drugs and knows anything. Like, now I'm just, like, about talking about my son, which I always talk about my son. Right. But now I'm talking about my house and things like that. And I was right. like, oh, you have to embrace that because that's who you are and what your comedy is. And you have to let the younger people, it's their time to talk about drugs. And Yes, stuff. yeah. I think, yeah, I, 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 I can definitely... Like you mentioned Taylor Tomlinson, that's someone who, I think you and I, we when we were touring, which was a year ago now, we're playing some big rooms and 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 sold out. And I think you and I just sort of would get in front of these big venues and kind of take it for granted a little bit. And then it dawned on me, Taylor Tomlinson, I didn't realize she's like, what, 23? I mean, she's mm. really young and, she would go out and do her set and do really well. And then she would walk back and she would kind of say like, oh, that's a lot of people. And I think, oh my God, that's right. You're 23. I could never have done what mm -hmm. she was doing at 23. No. I couldn't, I didn't have, I mean, she's, I was so impressed. I was so impressed with some of these, you know, some of these people we we toured with who, when they're really young and they can go out there and they have that kind of presence of mind mm -hmm. and they're able to walk out into that bright light and be in front of that many people. And some in sometimes situations where not everybody knows them or mm -hmm. they don't know them and win them over. And I was like, man, that is, that's impressive. Yeah, it's impressive. And um, the only thing we ever talked about was, you know, cause either her or Moses, they kind of had a thing of like, oh, we're the bathroom break before you get in. And, and you know, and I always want to remind them like, hey, if you're here, it's because you're amazing. Yep. And don't let the fact that they don't know you mean that, you, it doesn't mean that you're not amazing. Well, to be clear, Moses was there because he's very cheap. Yeah, yeah, he's easy to get. <laughs> it's really, yeah. it's so it doesn't cost it. No, <laughs> Moses Storm, uh, hilarious, Taylor Thompson. I mean, so many people on that tour, they were all great, but yes, I think, they did what probably I would do in their situation, which is make a self-deprecating jokes a little bit. And you'd want to say, that's, you don't have to do that. Like you can go out there and peep. Sometimes you need to tell the crowd what's up, what's what. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to go out and tell them, now I'm in charge and this is what we're doing. And that's one of the biggest things I learned. Yeah. Early on in my career, I was always asking kind of for permission to be there. And then I realized at some point, uh, you know, 
uh, so many other people, so many performers, and not even just comedians, but like Cher, I don't think in her life ever asked permission mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to entertain people. You walk up there and you just, you you walk up there and you go out there and you say, yes, now I'm, this is what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. I'm the confident substitute teacher who's taking control. I think people just respond to that control. Um, that's one of the biggest shifts in my career. And that came from from working with Chris D'Elia and just seeing how utterly confident he was and about like sometimes the silliest, dumbest joke. And I'd just be like, oh, like, but he is in love with it. And yep. they're responding to that. And I realized that I was treating comedy as if like, it was this roller coaster ride where I jumped in with the crowd and we're all holding on together. And I realized that I had a lot more power and a lot more fun when I realized I control this ride. Yes. I'm sending you on this ride. I know how it works. I know everything about it. I know it's good. And you, either you get on board or you don't, but you know, either way, the ride's happening. Well, see, <clears throat> that's something that I noticed. You would go out with these premises that no one else is gonna talk about. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and you would, your, your conviction in what you were talking about, your conviction in the material that you were doing and how this was really what you were gonna talk about and this is where we're going and uh, would totally like the room, you just had the room every time because this is what you decided this is what I'm doing. I'm going out here and, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about how I want to get my mom to hook up with LeBron James. Yeah. And I got to make that happen. It and sounds more like it's likely to happen when you say it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen, you, you, to, you know, it starts on a podcast and then it goes to God <laughs> and then God makes it happen. But I think that's the other thing too is um, you don't project when you go out there. You didn't project any neediness. You have a very, some people have a tone, I think a lot of comedians do, which is they're making up for the fact that they feel needy. Mm -hmm. So they go out and they go like, hey, okay. And that's where that mm -hmm. caricature of comedians comes from. It's all right, everybody, we're gonna have fun, woo. And they make a lot of noise up front to just show that they're confident and we're all gonna have fun. And all it does really is undermine mm -hmm. what you're trying to do. and. I noticed that you would walk out and you hold your microphone like at your sternum, like you hold it and sometimes you're on the verge of holding it too low, mm -hmm. but you don't care because people need to listen. Mm -hmm. And so you're other people that put the mic practically in their mouth and which is erotic, <laughs> uh, but they put have the mic like right up their mouth and they're shouting and you're speaking the way you're speaking now and you're holding the mic, and sometimes I'd be watching, I'd be think, maybe he needs to hold that mic just a tiny bit higher to make sure they hear. And it's like, no, you don't. That's how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is something that is a great gift to have that kind of presence. That's it, like to have that presence and be able to tell people this is, you know, and I think that transcends comedy. That's not just comedy, that's music. That's filmmaking. That's pretty much any artistic endeavor. And I do think, you know, people can roll their eyes if you start talking about what you do as art. And I think I decided a while ago, you know what? I am going for art. I am. <laughs> I may miss the mark a lot. And I know that it's a commercial business and I do a show every night and I do this and I do that, but I am going for something special and I'm always on the hunt for it. And so, and I think that's, that's the way I like to look at it. And I do think that that's the quality you need to have is approach it. You're not just looking for like, okay, I've got my 50 minutes, it's solid, these jokes land, we're done, let's go and I'm gonna crank this out. Uh, you know, I, I saw you play around a lot up there because you were looking for like, what's the next fun thing I can find that's going to excite you? you because mm -hmm. if it excites you yeah then you're good absolutely and i mean i really appreciate that compliment you're actually one of the very few people there's so many sound people who are always like 
hold your mic up, hold your mic up. And I go, this is, and I always, you're one of the few, few people who realize I do it on purpose. Yeah. Because I want them to listen. Yeah. Because I'm not there to compete with them, to compete with their conversation or their drinking or eating. I'm telling a story that is usually deeply personal mm -hmm. about myself or my son or my relationships or how I feel. And so I'm going to speak at a, my level and I'm going to encourage you to listen in. <laughs> yeah, the other thing is you're not afraid of silence. And that's huge. You're not afraid of, <clears throat> like I said, a lot of people need to fill all the air and you'll be killing and then you'll get real quiet and you'll, 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 as you move on to the next thing and you take your time. And I think that's, again, uh, you know, I noticed it took me a while, but I noticed years ago on my show when someone says something kind of outrageous, I don't need, my job isn't necessarily to top it or mm -hmm. match it. I can just react like a human being and be quiet. And there'd be a shot of me looking, <laughs> whatever, slightly uncomfortable because a 65 year old sex therapist just pulled out a giant dildo and mm -hmm. there's just a shot of me, you know, uptight Catholic taking this in, not taking it in. <laughs> 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 Inserting the mic, oh, that's not it either. <laughs> Putting it, um, no, there'd be just a moment of me like, let things play out in a human way and people love it because our culture is saturated with lights and noise, that sort mm -hmm. of game show energy. Mm -hmm. And so- With that desperation, spit takes and- Yeah. 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 And so I think that's what um, I've, it's funny to have the Achilles heel, which which I have, which is, uh, a neediness and wanting everyone to be happy and acknowledging I have that and I have to work against it. I can channel some of it, but I also have to fight it. And that's where the sweet spot is. It's somewhere mm. in between, you know? Well, that's good. Actually, I really needed to hear that. I feel like that's the journey I've been on for so long and that it's, it's a balance because sometimes I'm like too giving and then when I am get upset about it, then I'm too cold. Then I'm like, Oh, fuck everybody. I'm great. I'm doing good. You don't understand, you know, and that's that's not good for me either. So it is that balance of I think of like, this is what I'm doing and I hope you get on board. But if you don't, I'm confident with what I'm doing. But, you know, the other thing I'll mention just before we drop that subject mm -hmm. is uh, that struggle you just described never ends. Oh, I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, now. meaning, <laughs> meaning, yeah. But what I'm saying is, you know, you can get to a point, there are plenty of times in my life where I said, I think I figured it out. And whenever I think I figured it out, I get, knock, I get knocked off balance again and go through a period of being super insecure or then a period of being like overly, overly like, I'm doing it my way and that's just the way it is and everyone can suck it, you know? And it's like, nope. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm, after I've still got to fight my way back. And I think that'll be me on my deathbed. You know, I hope it's not for a long time, but whenever I'm checking out, I will be fighting <laughs> to get back on track. Um, I do want to talk about, because you, we've been mostly talking about the amount of time that you've been hosting the show mm -hmm. and everything. Um, what have you seen that you like or either dislike in the way comedy has changed in the past couple, two to three decades that you've been working in it. Um, I say this just because my assumption about the tour, even though I know you're doing the tour before, was that um, it seemed like, to me at least, late night has really changed to be more just celebrity driven and less mm -hmm. um, comedy driven. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it was a way of you showcasing it, like, here, here's the stuff I like, mm -hmm. here's what I'm about. Um, because I don't like that, but that's just me putting words in your mouth. Yeah. Um, well, you know, everyone has their, like, it's changed radically from, and, and I think this happens to everybody. It's like, if you talk to a huge movie star in 1932 and then talk to him again in 1952, he would say, I don't like the way it's all changed. You know, it's just everybody. This or like happened. when James Brown did a disco record. <laughs> <laughs> Best disco record ever. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say on a, on a, to be positive, 
On the positive side, what I like better about today in comedy is that it's more democratic because of the internet. So, you know, I mean, famously, uh, television when it was controlled by three networks and then four was so locked in its way of obviously white men and this is what's acceptable comedy. And one of the things that I like now is that anybody with a really funny idea, and I can, you can be, you can be someone in Akron, Ohio, who's 19 years old, who's Somali <laughs> and doesn't, you know, and, or his parents are from Somalia and uh, he's in his basement and he comes up with something and it can get 3 million views and people can just see that it's funny. So uh, that has, I think, been great for comedy is that, um, as we know, there are really funny, talented people, you know, it, all around the world, tucked here and there. And suddenly for the first time in like the history of human civilization, there's this device that allows someone who's got talent, who's absolutely nowhere to cut across all lines. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Obviously with the internet, you get the good and then you get a ton of shit. And there's a lot of just bullshit on the internet. Um, and I think late night shows have changed. I have this, they've become, you know, it used to be there was daytime and there was late night. Mm -hmm. And daytime was more of good time. What's all just, it's cheerleading kind of like good time. And then late night is, comedy, it's more comedy centric. And uh, I think the two worlds have kind of merged now. Hmm. And uh, I think, and and like I say, I don't like to put a value on it. I don't wanna say it's bad or it's good. It just is what it is. It's like, it's like uh, complaining about the weather. The mm -hmm. weather's the weather. That's what people like now, or that's what it has morphed into. And so, for example, I don't play games on my show because that's not why I got into the business. I'm very specific about what I, why I got into this business and what I like to do. And so I'm happy that I still get to do it. Um, and I'm also really grateful that I'm not in a situation where anyone's coming to me and saying, you have to play a mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. um, this celebrity's coming on and you have to play a game with them and uh, your Pictionary or whatever because um, this is not a knock against people that do it. It's just simply something I could never do. It's just not me. So I'm, gl I'm really grateful that I'm not in a position where, or I'm in a position in my life now where if suddenly Turner came to me and said, you have to play a game, I'd say, well, look, this has been great. I had a really <laughs> good time and I'm gonna go home now. Um, but I wouldn't be bitter about it or anything. I would really feel like I got to do exactly what I wanted to do for, Damn, if you start from, yeah, 26, 27 years, I got to do exactly what I, the kind of stuff I wanted to do. So, um, you know, I'd say that's the biggest difference I've seen is that it's, is that gra the, the landscape has changed a lot, but it doesn't bother me as long as I get to somewhere do what I like to do. It doesn't impact me. Yeah. So you're just still doing your thing. I'll do my thing and, and, um, I don't know, it feels like a, you know, I never wanted to, I don't wanna be that old guy that's saying, games, why that's not comedy, comedy is what I do. Because that's just, no one wants to hang around with that guy. Yeah, but in turn, you don't wanna just follow a trend and do something because that's what people- Yeah, do. no, don't, I mean, that's the thing is I think it's, uh, you know, we live in this really judgmental, the internet has made it possible for us to see just how fucking judgmental humans are. And all we do is say things either rule or they suck. You know? Meh. Yeah, meh. And so literally you can you can put <laughs> you can put, you know, uh Michelangelo's, you know, uh Sistine Chapel ceiling, a, a a giant picture of it up on the internet, and you'll get a lot of meh or that looks gay, you know, like just whatever. And okay, that's great. That's the that's the dark side mm. of the internet. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as long as you get to do what you want to do, I intentionally don't go looking for any comment about me. I don't want to know mm -hmm. what other people 
think of me. I have, when I walk around, plenty of people say really nice things to me and they seem sincere and I'm happy about that, but um, not interested in sort of polling America to find out how do you feel mm -hmm. about the sketch I did last night? And what do you think about me? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think anything good is gonna come of that. No, I've always felt, I've gotten into that trap before, but I always reminds me of like, oh, this is like keeping you in a middle school type of mindset of when you were afraid to like have your own individual opinion of what is funny. So you'd always like look to your friend and look over there and like, oh, if they're laughing, if the teacher's laughing, then it's okay. And I don't like to ask approval of like, you know, whatever, what do you think is funny? Is it funny or is it not? So I, I, and also I got in a bunch of Twitter fights. So my fiance made me get off Twitter. Twitter. Oh, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, see, I'm on Twitter in a very limited way, which is a joke a day, but it's not a conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's here's a funny thought I have today. You can love it or you can hate it. But um, someone could throw down with me on Twitter and I wouldn't even know it because mm -hmm. I'm not looking for that. I don't want to know. I don't want to get into a fight with anybody. Um, I, just, uh, um, I have a very old school approach to social media, which is I'll use this in the ways that, I'll use it in kind of an old school way, which is I made some stuff and I'm putting it out on social media. Mm -hmm. And if you like it, great. Um, and if you don't, it'll just go away because social media is, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's a rapidly moving river and this is one drop of water, so. But I don't, I don't want to get involved in it. I don't want to put my self-esteem in that black hole, you know? Yeah, no, I used to. Because uh, it was helpful. Because it was, um, that's how more people could talk to me. Or I could interact with people who I wanted to interact with. And then it got to the point where it's like, oh, I can just text people. I can just um, go on stage. I can do my podcast. Because when it's just these, you know, Twitter fights or people not understanding what I'm doing in a small amount of characters. It's like, yeah, I, so much of what I do is tone and inflection. And, and, and a lot of that gets lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so many times someone has texted me and I thought, wait, do we have a problem? And then I find out later, I real I reread it and I realize, no, that's just, look at their sentence again. It's, it's why people, you know, so many, I think if, when people are dating, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't imagine dating in this world now where people are, you know, in a new relationship and texting each other, how easily that could get fucked up. Oh yeah, well it's all of that because then it's also the Instagram and then people being like, are they looking at my Instagram story? Did they respond to my story? Did they put a heart on this? Oh, what are they doing? Oh, are they looking at somebody else's story? It's too much. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we haven't, I have this theory that, you know, humans have to evolve and it takes us a long time to evolve. And sometimes some, something shows up in the culture that we're not ready for. Mm. I don't think we're ready for the internet. The internet overnight completely, completely changed the way we, we communicate as human beings. And we've been gradually evolving for 250,000 years. And now suddenly over a two year period or an eight year period, we're supposed to suddenly be able to handle the fact that we know what everybody thinks about what we ate for lunch. <laughs> like, no, of course we can't handle that. We can't handle, um, and I, I'm at rehearsal sometimes and I'll look down and I'll see my head writer, my producer, uh, my line producer, and a couple of the writers all just looking down at their phones while we're running the comedy. And I'll say, what are y'all doing? And they'll look up and go, huh? Oh, no, I'm, I'm here. I'm like, you're not here if you're also there. And yeah, they'll say, you know, I'm looking at, something else that's show related, but sometimes they're just checking the feed to see what's going on with the impeachment or mm -hmm. or they're looking at porn, <laughs> um, which I encourage. Because mm -hmm. it, you know. I thought it was required. Yeah, it's, well, it used to be an hour at least a day <laughs> if you wanted to work with my on my show. You've got to prove at the end of the day that you've watched, a, you've been on Pornhub for an hour. But uh, no, that's, um, I just don't think we're ready for it. I think it was handing us something, this tool that we'll evolve to mm -hmm. figure out. But right now it's the wild west. That's an interesting way to think about it. I never thought about it like that. That's what I do. I say things and I blow people's minds. <laughs>
I want to ask you a couple questions that we ask everyone on this show before we got to let you go. Okay. Um, what are some of your goals right now? Personal, professional, whatever you're willing to share with us. What are you working on? Um, I am working on a bunch of things, like from the mundane to the more, you know, regal. But like uh, on the mundane level, I'm really just trying to like take care of myself physically. Like I'm trying to eat right. I come from um, Irish Catholic people that have no knowledge of what you're supposed to eat. So literally I grew up eating tons of fried ham and fried meat and fried potatoes. And my dad's a doctor, <laughs> but it's just like, this is what we eat. So I come from these Irish farm people, you know, that would eat that way and work in the farm all day and then come in at night and eat a bunch of, you know, um, fried ham with butter on it. And then they'd all die in their fifties. And I'm trying to, uh, it the way a lot of people are, I'm not trying to be crazy about it, but I'm trying to, huh how do I take care of myself? So, cause I'd like to be around. I have two kids. I have a 16 year old daughter and a 14 year old son. And I really want to be around. I used to have this kind of, I don't care when I go. Mm -hmm. I just want to make my comedy mark. I had that kind of, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a jet, jet fighter. And I just <laughs> want to be on the edge. And if I go down in flames, that's the way it is. I'm like, okay. Well, now I have that yeah, I'd like to be around. I'd like to be around. I'd like to enjoy my wife, my kids. I'd like to keep making stuff as long as I can. So um, I'm going to eat more vegetables. It just <laughs> like, sounds, I know it sounds really boring, but that's one of the things that I think about a lot more now than I used to. And it's kind of a goal, which is, um, you know, can I take care of myself? And then I've got other uh, goals like, you know, I started doing a podcast about a little over a year ago and realized, oh, I really like this way of communicating. And it's a way that I can communicate that's so different from the other way I used to communicate. So I'm just on the lookout for more things I can do. I like to be creative. I like to try to make stuff. And um, so one of my goals is how can I keep growing? Mm -hmm. You know, how can I keep... I don't want it to be just, he had a show and then he did it for this long. And then it was, you know, uh, then it's done. And he said farewell and disappeared. It, you know, I might find out in a year that I really like making clay pots, <laughs> that I make really funny clay pots that make people laugh. And there's something funny about them. And then that'll be my thing. Mm. It doesn't, I don't think I have a huge ego about what it is. I just want to keep finding things that I can do that, uh, make me laugh and allow me to hang out with other people that are funny. Mm -hmm. You know, like this technology right now, this, um, not that it's a technology, but this format didn't exist. You know, it wasn't this popular and it didn't exist, whatever, 10, 15 years ago, people weren't talking about podcasts. Now it's, it's grown and I uh, think about it. This is just a nice, really nice conversation where I feel like if this wasn't even being recorded, if you told me at the end, well, we didn't get any of that. I wouldn't be mad. I'd say, I really liked talking to Ron. I love Ron. We had a really good conversation. That was not a waste of time. We had a good connection. So this didn't used to exist mm -hmm. in this quite like this. So I think it's, this is amazing. And I think maybe more things are going to come along. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's going to be some other thing that comes along in five years that lets people like us play with our minds, you mm -hmm. know, and mess around and try and make each other laugh, but we do it and then it be, it's a pill that people eat. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to charge for it because we have to monetize it. You got to, you got to make some ad revenue off of it. Uh, I love that. I love both of those things. Uh, I just really like that Overall, you're just saying that you just want to continue to create. And what that shows me is, like you said before, where you're like, oh, I just like you because you like comedy because of comedy. It's like that spark to create is always there. That's one to do something of 
of doing a bit, even if there's no one to watch that bit. Like, yeah. some of my favorite bits are just me talking to myself. Oh my God, I do bits in the mirror of, I think my best stuff has been in the writer's room. Like I go into the writer's room and I get on a tangent and I do something and I people are like crying, they're laughing because I get on this really weird thing that can't be repeated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense when you try and talk about it later on. But in that moment, it just was really, really funny. And I, uh, I don't know, I live for that. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I think um, we're really lucky to live at this time in history when they keep coming up with ways for people like us to screw around essentially. I mean, we work hard, but, but, but let our minds run free. And then somehow there's a way that other people can hear it. And there's, it's has some value to mm -hmm. people, which is kind of cool. It's beautiful. I love it. I love the health thing as well, because that was one of the things I loved about traveling with you. Because, um, you know, I've been focused on my health for a few years, but every now and then I'd be like, oh, okay, I've done enough. And other people are having fun. And then I'd see you with your little almond butter snack and stuff. And I'd just be like, uh, oh, okay. No, he's still doing it. Yeah. I can still thing. do it. But I do say I go off. I do know how to go off the rails. Like I have like pizza, like mm -hmm. good pizza. Mm -hmm. I start and then it's like, I'm like a snake, my jaw unhinges <laughs> and I start shoving it. And it's, it's like, I, be, I become an animal. Like if you saw a raccoon get into the trash and find an old <laughs> pizza and it would just be tearing at it. I do that and my wife will say, she's stunned. Like what happened? You were you were eating a whey protein, you were having, sipping on a whey protein shake and having some green tea. like. It's just funny how the yin and the yang are always there. Yeah. You know, and, and it's everything we've been talking about this whole time, which is the insecurity and the confidence coexist all the time. And I'm gonna take care of myself. And I see you all the time on Warner Brothers lot. You've gone, you've been, you go to the gym, you take care of yourself, you look really good, but that doesn't mean that you're not gonna have a complete meltdown mm -hmm. in, in uh, 24 hours and then be like, and then feel like shit about it and beat yourself up, whatever, yeah. you know? Oh yeah, no. What's your meltdown food? Uh, usually cereal. Cereal or uh, a Philly cheesesteak. What kind of food. cereal? Um, I mean, usually it's whatever my son has in the pantry because they won't let me order cereals. If I could have my own cereal, it'd be Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Okay, that um, stuff is good. But I, I have to say, I have an, a huge weakness for old school sugar cereals Fruity Pebbles, mm -hmm. Fruit Loops, mm -hmm. uh, Lucky Charms, uh, Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries. Mm -hmm. I mean, stuff that is, if a scientist had to make something that would be, that would give you diabetes as quickly as possible, it would be those foods. Yes. But they are, I still love those foods. Yeah, I think it's, I have a Midwest love of trashy foods. I mean, I'd like just White Castle's frozen hamburgers. Not even, I don't need them from the restaurant. I'll take them. Frozen. And you eat them frozen. I eat them frozen. <laughs> <laughs> they last longer that way. You just gnaw on them through the night. You, 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 it's like chewing tobacco. You just keep it in your mouth like a lozenge. <laughs> you got there a really big, you've got a, a big gray <laughs> lozenge in your mouth. What is that? <laughs> frozen White Castle. <laughs> the last thing I want to ask you yep. is same thing we ask for everyone that comes on my podcast. It's just for a small piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Maybe just something you've been chewing on, thinking about, wondering, lately that you think could help our getting better community get better that's interesting something that would piece of advice um you know i would say one of the things that i keep coming back to over and over and over again is that we all get in despair and we all get anxious and we all get thinking that uh Oh, I'm screwed right now. Or I'm in a lot of trouble. And the piece of advice I would give to people, and I think this is true, and I've found this to be true. A lot of people think we've well, got to take this drastic action to change it. And that's not always the case. I have sometimes found that in my life, if you can just hang on, mm. things get better. <laughs> the world, the condition shift, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you can, um, if it's starting to feel like it's overwhelming, uh, 
like I'll say this to my son at night if he's getting really anxious about, I've got all this stuff to do in school and then I gotta do this and I gotta go to that meet and it's too much. I'll say, you know what, if it's 9.30 at night, go to sleep. Just shut it all down, go to sleep, read the boot, the computer. It's not that your problems will be different tomorrow, but they're just gonna seem mm -hmm. not as bad. Mm -hmm. And so I sometimes just tell people, um, uh, there's a lot to be said for just hanging in there, even if you don't have the solution. Just tell yourself, this is gonna work out, mm -hmm. even if you don't have the solution in your brain. And I do that sometimes. I say, I don't see a way out of this right now, but I'm just gonna table it. And it sounds simplistic and like, well, wait a minute, Conan, are you saying don't try? And I'm like, I'm saying sometimes, yeah, don't try to fix it. Mm. Just let uh, events take their course and you will see that things will seem a little better. They'll get a little better, you know? Yeah, I think that's great advice. And the fact that sometimes we think we have to be, that everything has to be such a fight and we have to be so active or conquering of every sing single yes. situation. I guess really what I'm saying is, this, yeah, is, uh, I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves. I must take action now and fix this. And sometimes I think uh, there are situations where it's so big and it's so overwhelming or our brains can only handle so much. There are times I go, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Mm. I honestly don't know what the answer is. I'm going to go watch an old episode of Breaking Bad. <laughs> and and then uh, I'm, or I'm gonna have a glass of wine and I'm gonna go, uh, you know, um, read a book that I, read some of a book or I'm gonna go play with my dogs and the, somehow it's gonna work out. Mm -hmm. And it's just a very simple way of saying, I'm gonna table that for now. Mm -hmm. I am not gonna take action and, uh, this, the answer will become clear. Yeah, sometimes you don't necessarily have to figure it out, you just have to outlast it. Yes, yeah, and I think a lot of people, that's why my motto sometimes is just hang in there, meaning just stay your ground. You don't have to move your, you don't have to move your game pieces, you don't have to do anything, just stand, just stay where you are and you'll start to see conditions around you change a little bit. Even though it seems unimaginable right now, things are going to make a little more sense something's gonna happen. It's like you're frozen in ice. You're like you took your ship up to the Arctic and you got frozen, the, the water froze around you and your ship's trapped in ice. Sometimes if you just stay there, the ice breaks apart mm. and, you're, and you know, you think I've gotta come up with the solution. Well, sometimes you catch a break. I think that happens a lot. If we just, if we stay patient. You just be a cat hanging on a wire. You just, just hang in there. Oh my God, did you just invoke that poster? Just yeah, I think you on. invoked the poster. It was your advice. I didn't say. You said just, did Will, did he not say just hang in there, oh my God, baby? <laughs> so my advice was just hang in there. <laughs> I think I had this, you know, it's so funny. I, I think I had a, I'm still working on this theory and I think it's more, uh, I think it was, it's more eloquent than that, but I accidentally, <laughs> I accidentally did say, just hang in there, baby. <laughs> and you know what? I think I'm gonna double down and say, that is my advice. If you were a kitten and you're hanging off a limb, <laughs> just hang in there, baby, and someone will take a photograph of it, <laughs> mass produce it, and they'll put it up in your elementary school <laughs> on the wall in your math class. So just hang in there, baby. Beautiful advice. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. I love that that's exactly what I said. It is what you <laughs> said. <laughs> I'm not denying it. I'm not denying it. I'm aware that this was recorded, <laughs> but that's my engineer and he can take it out. I know he can by slipping 50 bucks. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thank I you. I love hanging coming. with you. Oh, I love Lovely. Talking. Oh, I mean, again, just you've done so much for me um, in my career, just taking me out on the road, putting me on your show just from the beginning, from when I was just a young kid in Chicago and I didn't think that I had much to relate to and watching your show and it sparked my mind. It was like, well, this that, is the type of thing I want to That's do. the nicest thing I can hear. That's the nicest thing I'm going to hear today or probably this month. Like, that's the nicest thing because all I ever wanted to do was get my thing out there and, and the, the thought that really talented uh, young people like you got something or it inspired you in any way, that's 
all I need. I mean, I like the money. I want, <laughs> I want more of it, <laughs> but that's really all I need. Well, thank you. Thank you for everything. No problem. You too. Bye. That is funny. I'm like, how do I say this? Just hang in there. <laughs> Just hang in there, baby. Like, and then when you go like, you mean like hang in there like a cat? I'm like, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> that's exactly what you said. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> you made a fool out of me. If you this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam. Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up. Hit it up. Press the button. Press it!